Right. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 21st meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism uh, Committee. Can I uh, welcome uh, everyone, welcome our witnesses who I'll introduce uh, in a moment and welcome any visitors in the gallery. And I can remind everyone, please, to uh, turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Uh, we have apologies this morning from uh, Richard Baker, uh, and we are joined as a substitute by Jenny Mara. Welcome. Uh, item uh, one on the agenda, uh, can I ask if the committee are agreed that we take consideration of item three, a review of evidence heard in private later in the meeting. So I agreed? Agreed. Great, thank you. Uh, item two, um, we're, we decided as a committee we wanted to look at the economic uh, importance of uh, Edinburgh uh, festivals. Um, and we have one panel of witnesses uh, this morning to help us uh, do that. I'd like to welcome you all, starting uh, just on the left-hand side. We have uh, uh, Amy Saunders, who's Senior Advisor International with Creative New Zealand. Uh, we have uh, Gordon Dewar, who's Chief Executive of Edinburgh Airport. Uh, Faith Little, who's Director of Festivals Edinburgh. Uh, Lady Susan Rice, who is Chair of Edinburgh's Festivals Forum. And uh, we have Kath Mainland, who is the Chief Executive of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society. So, welcome to you all. We've got about um, 90 minutes or so uh, for this session. Um, and I think members will be interested in exploring a number of issues around um, how the festivals are, are, are set up and run, what the economic benefit is to Edinburgh, what the economic benefit is to the rest of Scotland for having the festivals here, um, issue, issues around, um, uh, for example, the infrastructure, the airport, transport, I think there's quite a number of things we want to try and pursue. Now, we've quite a large panel, and um, obviously we're going to very quickly run out of time if you all want to answer every question that's asked, even if you keep your, question, your answers very short, which I would um, always hope that you would do. <laughs> Um, and I always exhort members to keep their questions very short and to the point. So I think what I'll do is I'll ask members to, to, if they could perhaps initially direct their questions at a particular member of the panel, and then if you want to come in and answer a question directed to somebody else, if you just catch my eye, I will bring you in uh, and, uh, and try and bring as many people in uh, as time allows. But even with 90 minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll find the time runs away with us uh, very quickly. Um, I wonder if I could just start off and maybe just, just really give you all a chance to, 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 to have a say at the very start. Maybe ask you, all of you would comment briefly on, on a couple of issues. One is, um, uh, what, are, what, is, what do you attribute the success of Edinburgh Festivals to? You know, we, we clearly, uh, it's a success story. You only have to try and, try and walk around or drive around Edinburgh at this time of year to see how successful it is. We've seen all the statistics about... Uh, uh, the number of uh, bed nights, for example, being filled in Edinburgh. Um, so it is a success. What do you attribute that success to? And secondly, what are the challenges going forward? You know, if we're, if we're seeing continual year-on-year -year expansion, as it seems to be, of the festivals, what are the challenges to that not occurring in the future? Maybe I just start with, with, with Kath Mainland from the Fringe and just maybe work our way along the panel and just get your perspectives. Yes, thank you very much, and thanks very much for inviting us to, to come and talk to you this morning. Um, on your first question, why the festivals are successful, I think um, we'll undoubtedly talk this morning about our collaboration and our unique collaborative model through Festivals Edinburgh, but I think the thing to remember is that each of the 12 festivals are uniquely distinct and independent and, and are, are, you know, are, are, are formed because of... Um, artistic directors and programmers desire to show the best of what they want to the world so they're not they have very good benefits in terms of you know economic impact as we as we'll talk about but they're themselves distinct individual world-class platforms the best platforms in the world for Scottish artists and the best platform for international artists to come here any thoughts on, on the second point about you know what are the challenges going forward in terms of continual growth I think the challenges going forward are, are about continuing to remember that, that, that that's why we're successful, to continue to make sure that we have the best environment here for artists and the media and industry and uh, and audiences to, to come to this city to experience the festivals. Okay. Thank you. Susan Wright? 
Um, I think uh, th there's a saying that there's strength in numbers. So we have a lot of festivals um, and uh, we, we have a lot of activity. But what's unique here is that they are also absolutely unique unto themselves. And, and the unique part of it is that they come together through the festival's forum, for instance, um, to work on shared infrastructure uh, and other needs and to work with all of the stakeholders from s the city government, from uh, various supporting organizations and from the national government. So they can come together and converse and make this a better and stronger place for all of them and still maintain their separate identities. That's that's a really important thing. They're not all swept up into one common festival. That's very important. Um, the infrastructure here in Edinburgh has obviously grown and developed to support the festivals over the years. Every festival needs different kinds of of infrastructure in different ways. Um, but what is helpful is that we have festivals that run throughout the entire 12 months of the year, pretty much. Um, and so we have certainly... The, the biggest part of it and the greatest activity in these few weeks in August. But we have a lot of very important festivals that happen right throughout the year. That means that the city and those who work in it and, and, and live in it can support those venues uh, and, and the hotels and uh, and the kinds of transport that is needed. That all works throughout the year because there is a need for it throughout the year. So it's the 12-month thing. It's coming together when the festivals can and staying separate when they ought to. Uh, and the final point I would say is that uh, the festivals have been very fortunate indeed, even over the last six, seven years of financial difficulties in um, sustaining funding from both the national and city sources. That is absolutely essential, and I know that they are hugely grateful for that. Okay, thank you. Faith Little. Um, I think uh, you'll all be aware of the impact study that we did uh, a few years ago and that we continue to update, and that's on our economic, but also our social, cultural and environmental impacts. And uh, one of the clear uh, statements at the very beginning of that independent study was that none of those impacts, the economic and the others, uh, would exist without, and they described this as the diverse quality international programmes of the festival. So um, you know, my colleagues have already mentioned the importance of those individual festivals and their programmes, but the programmes of our festival sit at the heart of every other impact and need to continue to be able to be innovative, to develop and to be uh, in, invested in. Um, it's also important important about the, the adaptive city. Since 1947, when uh, the International Festival was founded, followed uh, in the same year by the Fringe and the Film Festival and then the Tattoo, the city began to adapt and respond to the needs of the festivals and needs of their audiences and artists. And it's one of the things that we are able to show off to visitors from abroad is not just our festival themselves, but how our city has responded, both through investment, of course we need investment, but also by being able to say yes through all the other complications that go on around planning and health and safety. This is an enormous enterprise. So our success is definitely founded on that. But it's also, our festivals are also loved. <laughs> by the people of the city as well. Almost 60% of the people in the city attend our festivals. Obviously, we want more to be able to come, but that's a remarkable figure. When you tell that to international colleagues, they can't believe it. And a city, that, a, a city of festivals and individual festivals that are loved by its own people can then, be, can then um, host and bring in visitors from elsewhere in a generous way. And again, if you walk around the city, all the people who are providing all the other services are positive and welcoming, um, and that's important. But in terms of challenges, um, we would have to say, obviously, that the contracting um, public purse and pressures on uh, both council and broader government budgets are are a threat to us and we're currently um, we've currently commissioned the a new thundering hooves report thundering hooves 2 which is trying to ensure um, that we remain uh, the world's leading festival city and competitive and to try and look at those factors so although I would like to identify more of those challenges in a way that report will will properly analyze those and bring them to the fore but we know that that's a key challenge and obviously there are other trends that we need to be able to respond to and the continuing issue around Around competitor cities. We are generous with our model, but actually there are still cities around the world who want to be able to uh, knock us off our, our pedestal, our perch. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Gordon Dewar. 
Yeah, possibly start by sort of declaring some other wider interests. Obviously, my um, Edinburgh Airport interest is obvious, but um, I'm also on the board of Visit Scotland, and I'm on the board of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, which uh, obviously represents the uh, the industry across Scotland. And I think it's just in that context that I'd like to say I echo uh, Faith's view that it's just the stakeholder embracing of the value of this and the general support of it. I think is very key. So I can't comment on how the internal workings or indeed the artistic value of the festivals. I'm not really qualified, but what I, I see all the time is that this this value by all the stakeholders involved about how much it contributes and going forward. Looking at the challenges, I think we're, we're already making progress against the two obvious ones. The overall capacity of dealing with that enormous peak that the festival represents in the city and indeed the surrounding areas and all of the infrastructure that supports it. But equally, the answer has already been um, looked at in terms of the scheduling, where the festivals have already widened their reach, spread that load and given ourselves an opportunity to do more and, of course, enhance economic impacts by having that, that uh, value coming through more of the year. So I think the, the, the sort of two themes there are um, working together and I, I still think there's a huge amount of optimism we can do even more of that going forward. Thank you. Okay. Amy Saunders. Um, hello and welcome. Just to give you a context, I guess I'm not sure, where New Zealand um, has brought over 200 artists. So for us, we've invested a million New Zealand dollars in that, so about £500,000. Um, and the reason that we've done that is because there is no other platform in the world that exists for us to give our artists that opportunity. Um, for us, it's the biggest marketplace, so we have artists across all the different festivals, and really they're here to look at onward touring opportunities, professional development opportunities, um, and it's in such a scale here that we can't do it anywhere else, really. So it's been a very successful season, and all those things have happened. Um, most of our companies have got touring opportunities we haven't had any sellouts yet, but um, it's, it really does offer us, and I think other countries from all over the world, a very unique platform to showcase artists across all the different art forms and year-round. Um, there's a number of other services that are offered through the Fringe Society and Festivals Edinburgh, the Momentum Programme, which brings in other international producers that we can help connect our artists and producers with, um, and the services that the Fringe Society run there's an enormous sort of professional development for our, our artists and producers. Um, we've been meeting with them regularly over this month and their capacity building just goes up and up, so they take that home and increases the, um, our own sector. So I think it's something that we'll continue to invest in, uh, maybe in a smaller scale going forward. Um, but this was a big sort of risky project for us that has certainly had a lot of benefit. And I can see other countries doing the same sort of thing, so what Edinburgh has to offer um, hasn't been replicated yet anywhere else in the world, um, but it's, um, it is the scale and the, and the expertise, I think, within the city are phenomenal. The challenges, I guess, are the obvious ones in terms of certainly for artists coming from a long way away, the costs in the city are escalating, accommodation um, is, is a big um, part of every company's budgets. Um, that can be off-putting, particularly for artists coming from a long way away. They've got airfares, etc. Um, that's one challenge, certainly, from the budgets we've put together for the companies coming over as accommodation. Um, but on the whole, yeah, they're still coming at the moment. <laughs> okay, th thank you all very much. I mean, I thought it was very interesting just listening to the contributions. You know how a lot of the same. Issues are being repeated about, you know, strength and diversity from having the 12 festivals uh, working together, the, the collaboration that, that there is, the mutual support, and the support that comes from the, 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 the wider community, whether that's you know, the public sector or just the people uh, of Edinburgh who are very supportive of having this event, and challenges around costs we've just heard and uh, infrastructure constraints and so on that uh, uh, we want to look at. And I think, you know, members probably want to explore quite a few of these issues uh, in some more detail. And I'm just going to open it up and bring in uh, Dennis Robertson and just remind members if, if they would keep their questions as concise as they can and I'm helpful if they could direct them initially to a, a one member of the panel uh, and if we can have answers that are as uh, concise as possible that would be very helpful and if you want to come in just try and catch my eye and I will, I will, I will bring you in as time allows. Uh, Right, I'll hand over to Dennis. Thank you. Uh, we all try and stay on the, the, the right side of the convener. Um, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> uh, maybe I uh, 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 put my question to Gordon Dewar because of his sort of multiple um, uh, sort of facets and hats that he, he's got with regard to this. Um, 
There seems to be a, a feel-good factor uh, this year, 2014 in Scotland. I mean, part of it, the Commonwealth Games, the success there. You know, we've got the up-and-coming Ryder Cup um, and obviously the, the festival that's going on. And um, Susan Rice said, you know, we, we, it's a 12-month aspect within Edinburgh and the, the sort of various festivals that are going on. And, but you know, I think perception is it's June, usually August. Do you think it's going to be difficult this year to measure the economic success of the festivals, given the other factors that were there, that maybe conflate maybe the numbers that are coming in? Um, clearly, measuring economic benefits is, is an inexact science, but I think the, um, the, the tools we're using, um, whether it's Visit Scotland or whether it's the festival themselves and looking at the impact, it's, it is about the visitor numbers, the spend they make, um, you know, whether they arrive to watch the tail end of the Commonwealth Games and then spent uh, the next period of time at the festivals, you, you might have a slight difficulty in distributing the value of that. But the value for Scotland PLC, I think, is very clear, uh, and we can see that and measure that in pretty reasonable terms going forward. So. I, would, I wouldn't over-concern myself about that boundary effect, if you like, but uh, the one beauty of the festival is that we can measure the, the bed nights, we can measure the ticket sales, we can measure the number of uh, other retail spend that's going on because all of the partners that understand the value of the festival share that in quite a lot of detail. Um, and the one thing we'd be absolutely certain of is that 2014 is a phenomenal opportunity to have not just talked to those that came this year, but hopefully put Scotland on the world stage for those that haven't quite made up their mind to come maybe next year or the years after. I mean, of course, we've had the homecoming as well. Uh, does Edinburgh Airport uh, in itself and the, the proposed expansion, um, uh, are you coping with the visitor numbers that are coming? Uh, always. We'll, we'll keep ahead of the demand. <laughs> for so, um, yeah, we'll, we're just about to open the new extension in October and we'll be uh, starting work on the next one later in the year. So we understand that you know, we've, we've got to keep ahead of that. It's a, it's a wonderful synergy where we know that if we make it easy and affordable for people to come to Scotland, things like the festivals uh, and just the wider Scottish tourism product is such that we will always have people to come. I often get asked, you know, surely there's a limit to the number of passengers you can service in a country of five million. I think we're, we're looking at the wrong end of the routes. There's seven billion out there that we want to attract. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, we, we, we didn't carry out an economic impact evaluation in our normal methodology this year deliberately because we felt that there were so many factors that might uh, warp that in this year. But as, as Gordon says, we will be measuring all the other things that, that we can measure against previous, uh, previous years. And thundering hooves later in terms of reporting, you're seeing that as the, 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 the way forward uh, in, in terms of future impact? In terms of how we move forward, yes, thundering hooves. Um, Susan, as the, uh, as the chair of the Festival for Forum, um, may wish to say something about this as well. But uh, that um, examination of how, how much we've achieved to date on the previous thundering hooves report... <laughs> um, we're also looking at um, we're also looking at the current context, so threats and opportunities, and the the wider environment. And then again, we'll be establishing the terms for how we move forward in partnership with our stakeholders and funders, which has been, I think, uh, the recipe for success to date. <coughs> Yeah, I, I would just say that the, um, well, first of all, no, I've never climbed on the back of the black horse, who was called Kinkara, but put that aside. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, we feel in the Festivals Forum that um, this report is really, um, will be formative for the future. I mean, the first Thundering Hooves, uh, 14 recommendations, and we have assiduously, since that came out and the Festivals Forum was formed, uh, gone through those uh, prompted, supported uh, and seen that many of these things have been achieved. It's a terrific roadmap, and not one that is formulaic, one that uh, has been absolutely specific for our needs, and we expect the same from this one. So we're very excited about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, keep running. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wonder if I may uh, probably start with, with uh, Amy and, and, and Susan. Um, clearly, this is a tremendous product, Sorry to be so crude, but the the uh, internationally known. How do we, or should we, try to replicate this worldwide? And if so, how would we do that? You want me to start, or I was just going to say, in a way, organically, it has been replicated worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the fringe, you know, models of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival are all over the world. The, again, the unique thing about Edinburgh is that famous statement that is the world stage as a city itself. I haven't seen any model that's come anywhere near to um, being as good as the Fringe and the scale and the size of it. 
So I think festivals throughout the world are replicating it. Um, there's a Fringe Congress here in the weekend. It's run by the Fringe itself. We had two of our Fringe festivals that were over part of that. So I think another great thing that the festivals here are doing is sharing that collaborative model um, and enhancing the kind of global reputation of festivals and offering artists and companies those opportunities worldwide. Um, and most people all know that those fringe festivals around the world all, you know, really were birthed out of Edinburgh, so to speak. Um, yeah, and uh, there are obviously international festivals, other festivals throughout the world that have appeared, and they're all here every year looking for work. And this is sort of the mothership, in a way, from my perspective. Yes, I think mothership. That, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amy said that uh, said that very well. Um, it, I'm not sure I would actually, and forgive me, uh, to w want to see this replicated everywhere else. And I don't think that's absolutely possible because part of what is unique here is the city of Edinburgh. I mean, it is, it is, it's an extraordinary city. We all know that. Um, but it's an extraordinary city for these festivals, the backdrop, the physical back backdrop, the size, the ability to walk around it, um, all of the infrastructure issues, the people. Uh, you can't lift that and put that anywhere else. So any other festivals or indeed festival city would have to build on its own assets. Uh, and I don't know of any city in the world that could do this. Having said that, the reach of our festivals is phenomenal. Um, and, and Amy's talked about the Fringe, but if you look at a number of the other festivals, the, the Book Festival has a ward alliance, which it set up over several years with book festivals around the world. And it has influenced and it has uh, helped create and has helped support uh, these uh, other book festivals and other festivals do the same thing. So we are seen as the leader elsewhere in prompting what those other cities and those other places can actually develop for themselves. Okay. <clears throat> Just to say that at the moment we ha we've had this week the Secretary of State for Culture for the city of Rio de Janeiro, the Mayor of Santiago, and at the moment we have the um, Culture Secretary for Buenos Aires City literally this week we're looking after them i was having dinner with the the um the um, culture secretary from buenos aires last night and what they're he what we what we're there to do we they're here to observe how we work they they do think it's astonishing they think there's nothing else like it in the world and what they will take back is a sense of our generosity in terms of sharing that model a sense of the the strength and power of our individual festivals how they work the models of how they also collaborate and work together, how the city works, how Scotland supports and enhances the festivals, and it's part of what contributes to our sense of a confident, outward-looking national identity. So at every level, from how the festivals work to how they relate to the city to how Scotland is seen, is perceived by these people as being something um, incredibly strong. It can't be replicated, uh, but elements of it can actually help to feed back into how we work. So what we hope is that these countries will develop ways of working that will then allow their artists to come back to Edinburgh in a strong and confident way and enhance our programmes in due course. Yeah. I think my voice has pretty much covered it. I was going to mention the Congress that Amy said we had uh, 39 different fringes from around from 15 different countries here in the city. The, our colleagues at the International Festival, of course, had the Culture Summit here in the Parliament the weekend before. Susan's mentioned the Literary, Literary Alliance. And I think these are not about replicating, but it is about sharing our models. And it is about uh, increasing the global international reach of the brand of the festivals. And it's also really important um, in terms of roots for artists. So all of these festival directors and producers and cultural entrepreneurs and, and policymakers are in the city looking at what we do. And we're generously sharing that with what with them ultimately leads to that to that to the marketplace element the fact that then scottish artists and the other artists coming here then have roots to other work and tours and life and you know career development and professional development for the for the life and that's really good for the you know for those artists but it's really good for the for brand scotland too you know that scotland is an international cultural recognized brand i, I mean i think you know i mean um no one can doubt the success, your success, and, and well done. Uh, uh, but, and I apologise for uh, a rather crude question, but my financial background. When I asked the question, I was really looking to see what, given that investment and sharing, which is great and, 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 and develops Brand Scotland uh, even more, but I was looking for what financial return do we get from spreading the, or, or marketing the brand? Uh, I actually think Susan, <laughs> Su I think Susan and Faith probably. 
Um, do we well, the, the the first return is that in in marketing that brand, we're we're bringing in more visitors, more artists. <laughs> um, if you think about the fact that there are over twenty thousand artists in the city, for some places that would be a, a, a festival in itself in terms of the numbers coming in. So, um, we, we're doing a number of things when we're we're going out into the world. So we're doing consumer marketing. Um, which is is dependent on the strength of the brand, the cultural brand. Um, and we're also doing, um, I suppose, high-level kind of cultural diplomacy relationship marketing, which is about perception. Um, and then more broadly speaking, we're doing active artist and producer engagement. So encouraging people to come back here to enhance w what happens on the platforms of our different festivals. And every one of those contributes, some of them in more subtle ways. Obviously, the consumer marketing is about increasing, you know, visitor number of visitors and visitor spend from our selfish perspective, ultimately bringing more people into the city to buy tickets. But every time that happens, they're also extending their spend. So there's a direct value in terms of that brand building internationally um, in terms of the broader um, in terms of the, the that kind of cultural diplomacy side of things then we definitely see ourselves as part of team Scotland so when we are out in a country so to give you an example when I was um, out in China I was simultaneously meeting with artists and cultural organizations and um, we were part of a travel trade fair working with a uh, visit Scotland and visit Britain and uh, and the final thing I was doing was I was doing inward investment meetings for the city while I was there too now we don't do that on every occasion Occasion, what we'll normally do is get into partnership, if we can, with SDI on the ground so that we're meeting with them. Um, to give you another example, the Edinburgh International Festival's director has done launches around the world of his programme, connecting to their programme. But when he's doing that, we're also encouraging SDI uh, and partners on the ground at diplomatic level to make sure that the business community is engaging. And there's a sense when you have a very strong cultural brand that what you're conveying is an image of a dynamic, outward looking, connected country that's about exchange in both directions and exchange in both directions matters we can't just go out there and say we're fabulous we're also learning and connecting and exchanging ideas with these countries as well we think you're fabulous that's okay <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry Gordon would want to come back in yes yeah. just a small point if we draw in the um, fence around the world and come to uh, the nation um, there's also a lot of ripple effect outside of Edinburgh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that either. Um, there are, I forget how many, again, I'm sorry to mention the book festival, but since I chair that board, as well as the festivals forum, that's the one I know best, but I've lost count of how many little local book festivals, literature festivals there are right around Scotland, and they all help in those local, often very small localities, often, you know, tiny, you know, really villages right around, uh, bringing people in, they help the local economies, they also, again, create a kind of feel-good factor, and that ultimately has probably an unmeasurable impact uh, on the economy as well. So we mustn't forget that kind of influence as well as the broader. Gordon, yeah. obviously there's a huge amount there, and the value of that is it's quite difficult to quantify, but I think it's really evident how it's happening. But let me give you a really tangible example. Um, we're out there obviously selling Edinburgh and Scotland as a, an opportunity for airlines to come and invest all the time. Uh, on page three of our 24-page sales document, which sets out what Edinburgh and Scotland's got to offer, the festivals are front and centre because they do generate huge amounts of demand. And um, we've, we've gone about this in a really um, numeric, very business orientated investment uh, agenda where we're actually putting a business case in front of airlines and saying this is how you can make profitable investment coming into Scotland and if I look at just the long haul alone two years ago we had one long haul flight into Edinburgh and to New York uh, we've now got seven and that's hugely driven by the fact that um, we've got the opportunity to show that not just in August but actually through seven or eight months of the year the festival is directly contributing to demand and for the rest of the year it's actually raising the brand and people want to come to Scotland and Edinburgh because of what they've heard and what they've uh, seen in terms of that coverage elsewhere, be it through Visit Scotland, be it through social media, whatever. The, the ability to sell that, and in no way criticism or um, boasting, but we've got to put the scale on this. The, the festivals are significantly larger than the Commonwealth Games, and they happen every year. So we did their absolute, Scotland did itself proud, Glasgow did a fantastic job of talking to some new audiences, sports oriented audiences, and of course selling the fact that Scotland is on all Edinburgh. But we cannot... Um, 
un undervalue what Edinburgh has every single year in driving people to come sample and hopefully come back time and time again to one of the best brands, I think, in the world. Uh, without uh, without an ex remote exaggeration, I think Edinburgh is the best place on the planet to be in August. It is that level. It is that quality. Yeah, I, I accept that. We've got one last question. Uh, Amy, Sorry, Amy, if you want to come Sorry, in. Amy, I was going to say, actually, one other thing is, in terms of the artists that come here, for us, because it's such a large number this year, a, they're going off to Stirling and places on their days off, but B, they're going home, you've immediately got 200 ambassadors who have come on board as ambassadors for Scotland, um, and they will come back in the off-season on holidays, and I've heard all of them talking about bringing families back and that. So things like that that maybe we don't think about as immediate impacts um, are very strong because they have a generally such a positive experience whilst they're here. I think that's great, uh, and uh, I mean, obviously, uh, it is fabulous and a great success. Um, Faith, you mentioned you know, uh, the analysis of opportunities and threats. Um, with perhaps some regard to infrastructure, what, uh, what threats do you see in limiting the continued growth of the festival? Um, the, uh, what I want to say, first of all, it doesn't all need to be about growth. <laughs> um, what's most important in terms of brand is making sure that we maintain the quality and the innovation of, of the programme. So there's something really important. There's also a, an issue around how we can extend in all areas that we work and in a way this I really like this to be part of the conversation is that we are strong. Of course we need to continue to be invested in at the heart of all it's investment in our programmes that is the most important thing. But we we also um, want to be able to extend the benefits of what we do. We, we want to be capitalised on, I guess, on all these levels. So if I take it right down from the kind of relatively local to the, the, the global, um, on the relatively local side, um, you know, we've got new rail networks coming in. We think, we, we believe that we can continue continue to grow if, 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 if people are also staying out with the city and that the benefits of that can extend into the borders and up into Fife and, and further afield. For lots of international visitors, the kind of distances that we're talking about are not major. We also learned a lot, um, I think, this summer between Glasgow and Edinburgh. We cooperated a great deal on positioning and media. And what we really understood was that the distance between those cities is nothing to most of the people who are coming here. And again, encouraging movement and benefits across the whole of the central belt, but also also beyond uh, in terms of people staying and almost being festival commuters is a, is a real uh, is a real possibility. On the global side of things, um, we really do believe that we could be used more effectively. We have amazing contacts. We have profile. We are a global brand. We could be used more effectively to be part of the messaging, which actually Gordon already uses in terms of um, you know the, the relationships of encouraging companies to come in and invest in Edinburgh Airport and bring in um, a, bring in new routes. But actually, we really genuinely believe that. Um, our profile and positioning and our internationalism, that generous, accepted connection with other countries is a really great route for Scotland to say, yeah, yes, we're here to do business, but the first thing is that we understand you, we're connecting to you. Those are the, those are the foundations that we think we can build on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, um, Susan touched on a, a moment ago quite an interesting point about spreading the benefits of this across the rest of Scotland, and I think Mike McKenzie wanted to ask some questions. Yeah, on that issue. Thanks, my daughter. A couple of other questions yeah. as well that, uh, um, if it's all right, I'll just yeah, yeah, yeah. ask the full sweep. Mm -hmm. um, Briefly, I hope. <laughs> I'm known, for, as for you know, for my brevity, but um, <laughs> in more general terms, uh, just before I get to that, I was struck, very much struck by the you know, we're, we're talking about this in, t in business terms or economic terms, and it strikes me that it's you know, and, and I suppose it was a surprise to me that it's a very sophisticated, complex business. Um, and I just wondered uh, what lessons there are for other business sectors. I mean, I was struck by faith using words like um, ecosystem, organic, uh, by Kath talking about um, collaborative uh, competition or it might have been competitive collaboration, I'm not quite sure which but um, and, and it almost has a kind of open source feel to it. Are there lessons for other business sectors in, in the success of the festival? Who's that? To, whoever. Okay, <laughs> I'll maybe start while everyone else comes up with a sensible response. 
Um, so the the answer is yes to to some extent, and I think we actually see some of these things in in very different ways. What festivals do is 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 present something to the public, and so we connect with them in a certain way, and we have ways of working together. And as I said before, working separately. I would also say that if you are primarily on the festival side, you really do try to think in organizational and business terms. If you're primarily on the business side, you tend to look at some of those other factors. It isn't all just one or just the other. So I said something about going around Scotland and little festivals coming up and the sense of well-being that that creates in other parts of the country. That isn't a business concept, but it's actually very important. But having said that, um, if you look at something like uh, the oil and gas sector, um, because they have up in the northeast primarily a geographic uh, kind of invisible fence to some extent and have grown up together, they have a body and an organization that pulls them together, that speaks for them, that reaches out around the world, that invites people in and so forth. There are some things that are done that are similar, but we don't see it in the same way because we don't see into businesses in the same way that we see, we as, as audience, if you will, or we as, 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 as people within the city that we see into the festivals. So there's a, and, and the festivals bring, bring what they bring to us, whereas other businesses bring their stuff out, if you see what I mean. So we, we perceive it differently. But I think some of these things happen. I'm not sure that there are um, primary lessons. I think there are times when businesses get together because they share a common problem or an issue, and then times when they compete. And if that's what you're talking about, we do the same things. I'll see. Would you like to say some, uh, something very, very uh, briefly? Um, just again in Scottish terms, we were talking about kind of imitation elsewhere. But what what Scottish enterprise, our key partners, uh, describe us as is in our collaborative context is as a pathfinder, that we 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 work out ways to do things in quite a complex organic way. We evolve effective models, we test them out in in a in a very big environment, and then we often roll them out uh, into the wider cultural sector or indeed the wider tourism sector. Yeah, my face covered. I, I, I don't know whether there are things for businesses to learn, but I think our what we have learned in the last six, seven years of our collaborative model has been really interesting for us. We are, of course, individually, as we said at the very top of this, distinct, unique, competing festivals in lots of ways. But we, but we've worked out a system of where we are stronger when we are collaborating, and particularly in markets and and countries for for the fringe, particularly international work. It's very beneficial for us to have not just Festivals Edinburgh in that collaborative working model, but also the International Festival, which is a proper pathfinder for international companies and artists coming here, and working out where, we, where there are challenges and where we have to work with stakeholders on challenges to become easier to work with in some ways by collaborating together. So I don't know whether there are lessons to be learned in that for other businesses, but certainly we've learned a huge amount from that in the last few years. Yeah, thank you, and I'll, I'll move on, uh, um, if I can, convener to the... Um, the, the, the other thing that interests me is that, you know, to what extent do you see yourself as a hub um, uh, and a springboard for some of the other festival type uh, um, events that happen in other parts of the country? And I mean, I'm thinking Highlands and Islands, obviously Orkney, you know, does this pretty well, but there's a, you know, um, folk festival in Shetland, jazz festival in Isla, Heb Fest in the Western Isles. But equally there, there are also uh, areas that in festival terms are kind of cultural deserts across the Highlands and Islands. Do you see an opportunity to kind of um, help, given the social economic impact and good that arises from this, do you see, do you feel a responsibility and do you see an opportunity to spread out into those other areas that are as yet untouched by this phenomena? I think um, we, all, we have to be concerned a bit about trying to colonise areas that actually have their own wonderful cultures and you know ways of doing things. So one of the things that we do do um, is that our individual festivals, a lot of them, work across Scotland with programmes that are drawn out of the festival. So we don't go in and land a festival with people. But to give some examples, our science festival runs the biggest theatre and education programme in Scotland. So it is out there working with um, you know a quarter of the school children in the whole of Scotland every year and then moving on and communicating with more of them the following 
following year. Um, our Imaginate Festival, our Festival for Children and Young People, runs a major touring programme of their work. So the, the, they're rolling out the, the, the riches of their content to the rest of Scotland. Um, but we, we, and the Tattoo, for example, has just been doing, it was, I think it was in Aberdeen just yesterday or the day before. So there are elements of what they do. The International Festival has reached out and done outreach events, but one-offs, not, not kind of landing with everything that, that we do. Um, but what we do do is act as a kind of centre for advice. We, as I was saying, we test out ways of working about how we collaborate. We've kind of codified some of our knowledge and turned it into a seminar series, which we share. Um, I and some of my colleagues go out and talk to... So, for example, we, we ran a workshop with the cluster of festivals in Aberdeen, which hadn't quite consolidated. They didn't quite know how to work. So I spent a day with them workshopping, defining the things that they could work on together using our methodology to try and bring them together to work in a new way. So we advise and support and our culture, we've created a culture of festivals that is infectious. <laughs> so I would say that the growth in festivals around Scotland is partly through the inspiration of what has happened here. And our individual festivals, like the Book Festival, have, have supported the, the, the growth of a network, I think, of festivals around, around Scotland. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and I would just say, I mean, of course... Amy's already touched on it with her artists, you know, the, the, the Edinburgh and the festivals in Edinburgh being a gateway to the rest of Scotland for, for the audience. And, and not to forget that, as Faith mentioned before, there are 25,000 artists throughout the year who are here as artists, but also as audiences. And one of the things that we were very careful to do through the Momentum programme, which, is, which Amy touched on, which is about us bringing international cultural practitioners, cultural agencies, governments, creative entrepreneurs from around the world here, not just in August, but all throughout the year, uh, we always make sure that we widen that out to the wider cultural sector in Scotland, not not to determine what they might do, but at least that those connections are being made so that so that so that there might be a legacy for work to develop throughout the year. And we know that lots of work comes out of the meeting of artists here. You know, lots of artists, not just from Scotland, who come to the festivals. We know from the impact study said that it encouraged them to meet more people, to see work from other countries that they wouldn't normally see, and then to go on to create work that they perhaps wouldn't have created otherwise. The gateway idea, I think about us as a tourism gateway for people coming in here, but also as a gateway in terms of opportunities for artists in Scotland um, to both present their work in, in Edinburgh, but to take ideas back and, and, and nourish their communities with them. And final question, convener. Um, if you had an ask of this committee, this parliament, the Scottish government, what would it be? Um, I guess what I would say off the top of my head is um, to to be or to continue to be champions of this agenda and the cultural agenda more widely. Um, culture, if you will, goes in and out of fashion sometimes um, in societal terms. Uh, I personally believe, and I've said this frequently in public, that you don't have a healthy society unless you have a strong cultural base. I think it is utterly important to continue to support cultural activities and something as strong and powerful as this. We, you know, it's a jewel. And so it would be to have that championship from Parliament parliamentarians and from, from anyone in public life. And then the other thing is, I mentioned funding before and said we've been hugely grateful for the funding all of the festivals have, for the funding they've had, particularly the Expo program, which is of the last few years. Um, we worry every year and every day about where will the money come from in the future. That's what festivals do. Um, and so the other thing we could ask is, please keep that on your agenda and please give us the funding, but also keep the style of not intervening in what we do. Cultural uh, matters have to be delivered by the artists. Good. Are you able to add anything, Kath? Just very quickly, I would say just... Just to, to continue to, to remember that the impacts aren't just cultural and, and they're not just in Edinburgh, and that actually we're very strong on you know attracting talent and jobs and investment into, into businesses here, into the creative economy, um, and to, to remember that and then exploit us. You know, we, we've talked about the work that we do in the different areas that we touch on, and so whether it's Revisit Scotland or SDI or business community, just, you know, don't forget that we're an exploitable resource for you too. Can we to add anything briefly? 
I mean, we really appreciate the cross-party support that we've had, and we don't take it for granted, and nor do we take for granted the kind of additional investment. And it's programme in the th in the Thundering Hooves report, the first report, uh, programme innovation and investment was one of the key things that was um, that was pointed out as as being essential to everything else. The Expo Fund has been really important that way, but it's also allowed us to then lever an extended partnership. So we brought in over a million pounds of additional investment in 2012 and 2014 through partnership working uh, and Expo definitely helped to motivate that partnership not just among ourselves but in that extended community and um, so I think the other thing I would just say is in order to kind of carry on be being able to invest in our success for the benefit of Scotland we do also need to think about what we're dealing with in terms of budgets and contracting support and to think with us inventively about how we address that we're not part of the Thundering Hooves 2 report. We'll be looking at how we do that. But we know there's a contracting public purse and we need to work with our partners in the private sector to make sure that we're investing, not just in the festivals themselves, but in, in their marketing in collaboration with the other, uh, the other assets of the city and the other assets of Scotland. Uh, Gordon, yes. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, true, and I'll come at it from the point of view of hopefully a supporter. Um, we, we're, we contribute as a company to Marketing Edinburgh, which obviously, again, is looking at everything that Edinburgh has to offer with festivals being front and centre. I think, you know, recognising the, uh, the limited ability of the public sector, I think the private sector does need to find a way of um, getting mechanisms to put more investment in. I think the case for that return on investment will be very strong. I think what we're missing at the moment is some of the mechanisms that would allow that to be rolled out. So while I, I won't sort of guesstimate of what might be successful in terms of mechanisms, what I think is important is that the Parliament and indeed the um, City of Edinburgh Council um, are finding an environment that allows private investors to feel as though whatever is asked of them is equitable, feel as though it's minimal in terms of its administration costs and I think the most important thing, uh, having some visibility of how that money will be invested. And I think if we can achieve these three things, I actually expect to find quite a willing audience amongst the corporates and amongst the, the business community. Because I think, as I've said at the start, I think people genuinely do understand the value of the festivals and indeed tourism. We just need to find ways of making it an efficient way of them putting their money where their mouth is, uh, where they can see the benefits rolling in every single year in terms of what the festivals bring. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, Margaret McDougall. Thank you. Um, first of all, can I just say, I uh, apologise that I wasn't able to attend the event last night because I was actually attending the tattoo. And I have to say, it was really enjoyable. It was absolutely fabulous. Um, and my question is around that, um, in that, you know, the two's, ha tattoo's happening over these two weeks. How do you extrapolate the benefits of the tattoo from everything else that's going on in the Fringe and the rest of the festival? Very detailed government green book analysis. So the tattoo is one of our festivals and they're part of our extended collaboration. So basically we analyse it in exactly the same way as we as we do our other our, our other festivals and, and look at the economic benefit by means of a, an agreed government green book um, economic uh, impact uh, uh, process. Benefits. We can show that we can break down the benefits between uh, between the festivals. We all know these methodologies change, yeah. so but we have to use a methodology that's agreed by our partners and stakeholders and that's comparable with other areas. So, for example, we are able to compare the economic impact of our festivals with the economic impact of golf tourism, and our impacts are significantly higher. We're able to do that because we stick to a government green book uh, approach. Um, and my other question is around, I think it was yourself, Faith, who mentioned uh, the costs, and obviously the costs for tourists and for artists alike. What collaboration is there with the uh, hoteliers and uh, you know, other businesses who are providing accommodation around um, costs? I know it's a free market, but you know, is there a sort of limit? Uh, at the moment, it's a market limit. We we engage in a constant dialogue, particularly through um, the Edinburgh Tourism Action Group, um, and you know regularly raise our concerns. There there is an issue about allowing the not interfering too much and allowing it to operate as a market. But we do feel that there are. Yeah, we're beginning to get to the stage. Um, Kath may wish to say a little bit more about this from a fringe uh, artist's perspective, but we need, do need to think about the, the the visitors as well. And I I know that there is definitely being talked about that it's at the the limits of of 
of tolerable. So we all need to work on that together. But at the same time, we want the hotels to benefit. You know, it's part of it's part of the exchange of value that we're all engaging with in the city. Did you? Yeah, I mean, our, our, our job from a, from a fringe perspective, our job is to is to ensure that the environment here is still one where artists and companies want to come and, and showcase their work. And, uh, you know, Amy touched on it from an, from an international perspective. It is undoubtedly true that it's an expensive undertaking. It's a, you know, it's a creatively risky experience for fringe companies. It's also a, uh, it can be financially uh, onerous too and I think we just have to be aware of that and just work with our partners on on balancing the you know the benefits into the business community and, and into the economy with the with the ability of, of fringe companies and, and other artists to still present their work here just, just what sorry Tenliers are um, cooperative and want you know are they just there because we all know I think we've all heard stories about you know the prices triple and um, during the festival and how collaborative are they? Uh, the are there to, to, you know, make a profit within mm -hmm. the marketplace. So uh, we do feel that we're at the stage where, you know, they need to look at it as well as a risk to all of us. And that's the, that's the kind of... Because we can't oblige anyone. A lot of how we have to work as, as Festivals Edinburgh, the collaborative body, is through influence and not power so it, it is about a conversation and the conversation we're raising is about city reputation <laughs> um, and that's in all our interests and um, and so I think that the that surveying when we do our economic uh, impact which will probably be again next year we would like to work on trying to look at attitudinal um, data which we'll then be able to feed into a more we have to use, we have to use evidence in order to be able to have a have a proper discussion about these things so um, the conversation continues um, it is an issue um, but in order to really address it I think we need to do some some serious research thank you and just a small point um, where do you put the people who come in the artists and so forth and producers and whatever in Edinburgh um, limited number of rooms costly rooms and so forth but then other entities jump in as well so Edinburgh University is another hat I wear um, opens up a lot of its residences uh, to people who are coming in and that is low cost helps the university because they fill them when they might be empty and provides more beds on a different basis from uh, from a hotel so you know we are endlessly inventive on how to try to tackle some of these issues and that in turn contributes to the economy <laughs> if you think about the, the relationship with the university as a both as a host for spaces and as a, an accommodation provider is part of the economy that allows it to operate year-round also a big contributor to why people want to come and study at the university here in the in the first place but i would also say that you know french french artists particularly are not staying in hotels there are other places for them to stay in. and if we're talking about increased infrastructure links and, and actually your question check about spreading the benefit out maybe there are new models and infrastructure links that can help us actually find solutions not just in the city center okay thank you uh, gordon and keeping up but um, I think the planning environment in Edinburgh at the moment in terms of hotel development is quite positive the city is very supportive of more capacity uh, and indeed I can see quite a lot of green shoots of, of projects that are coming online we ourselves are going to be developing an airport uh, a hotel at the airport in the next uh, couple of years and we know of a number of other um, developments in that vicinity going around as well so it's probably coming a little too late and it's not been helped by the downturn in the economy but I think hopefully in the coming years we'll catch up with some of that capacity um, of course, the big challenge is to make sure that that can be a profitable exercise all year round, which again comes back to my comments about how do we make sure that we harvest the benefits of the festivals throughout the year, um, although we have moved significantly in that uh, degree over the last few already. Okay. Um, Mark Thank you. Uh, the, the MSP representing Edinburgh Central and... Uh, <laughs> And actually, as somebody who, as a, a student, used to stand on the Royal Mile handing out flyers, getting people to come to my show, I, I, I never really needed to be convinced of the, 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 the great case and the great strength of Edinburgh. But I would like to just take a little bit of credit for having pushed the idea of having this session in our uh, agenda setting uh, meeting. But uh, I'm really concerned about the, the breadth of participation. I think others are going to refer to the, the audiences again. But... You touched on it there, the, the, the artists and the costs and uh, the difficulties there. So I wonder, um, Kath, could you... The, the Fringe programme is full of shows, events being put on, the vast majority of which will not break even. Is that an issue? Well, we, we talk a lot about costs and benefits, and our job, I think, is to... I mean, I don't 
I don't know exactly if I would, if there's evidence to, to, to suggest that what you say is right. I don't know that. But we know that certainly it is incredibly creatively and financially onerous to bring a company here. One of the things that we look at, as much as we try to, to do what we can on the costs of coming, is actually to look at the other side of that and to increase the benefits. And so I know that for the vast majority of companies coming to the Fringe each year, they're doing it as an investment in the future life of their company. So we work, um, as Amy touched on before, we have a big programme of professional and career development advice. We, we work with the arts industry. We uh, accredit over a thousand arts industry professionals who are coming to the Fringe each year from over 40 countries who are here looking to buy work. Um, we have all sorts of opportunities for fringe companies to get in front of those people to sell them their work. Um, we get we put them in front of the international media and all those are things that. So yes, it's expensive to come here, but if you see that an investment in 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 your work, so you look at companies like Catherine Wheels with with White, you look at you know Black Watch, Stomp, those companies that started here, that then go on to have a life much much outside Edinburgh and for quite a long time there's a, a producer that we work with who's, who's not Scottish who's doing a show actually this year who launched a show here 10 years ago and she, you know she said that it was an incredibly expensive undertaking but she managed to launch something that went to 40 countries and, and then toured for 10 years on the back of it so so I think yes we have to be we have to be aware of the costs of companies and make sure that it's still an environment where people want to come but the other side of that is to make sure that the benefits are there and that actually it's still a place where you can create a significant life for your work and your company that um, most of our companies have all done well, but they've had a lot of lessons coming out of it. So it's been good to go back. And, one th and we had a lot of meetings with them beforehand about expectations and budgets and everything. Um, and I think some of the learnings going back are to have realistic expectations and to set your box office at a real realistic um, percentage of what you, as you say, is that 30%, is it 40%. Um, and really come prepared for, and we said to everybody, what are your top three reasons for coming? None of those three reasons were to make money. Um, it was about onward touring, about professional development and networking. Um, still the box office is onerous and they're all walking around this week kind of going, oh, it's one week to go. Um, but they're all, they, if you would have asked them, would you come back, they would. Um, but they would come back um, with slightly more prepared in terms of what they're here to expect. Um, and I think we've learnt that also in terms of coming, it has to be the companies that really are coming and are very clear about why they're coming. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying, um, but actually I think if the right preparation's done and the companies are in the right place before they come and they know why they're here, that the benefits still exceed um, the potential negative financial outcome. So the programme that Amy is, has brought here with Creative New Zealand, led on from Creative New Zealand's side, is, is across seven of our festivals. So there are multiple platforms available for artists with their different needs. Yeah. One of the, the things that I think drives a lot of the costs and is an important area for the, the festival or the venue chains, you know, the likes of Assembly, Gilded Balloon, Sea, the rest. How is the relationship between the fringe in particular and the venue chains and, and how important is that going to be for the ongoing economic viability of artists wanting to come here and, and showcase their work? Yeah, I mean, venues are, venues are hugely crucial to the, to the growth and success of the fringe and not just the, the kind of managers that you're talking about, but actually the landlords that Faith has been touched on before. But it's a very... Uh, the, the fringe is, is fueled by a sort of creative entrepreneurial drive, I guess. There, there seems to be a, a, an unending ability to find space and to make space available, but also to create different models of, of space and different models of venues. So there are very, very big venues with multiple spaces producing a huge amount of work themselves. There are other venues that are very small and, and site-specific and companies who'd say, well, actually, I don't fit into that model. Let's find another model. And I think one of the, one of the great things, one of the things I love about the Fringe is it's a completely organic, model and it and it and people will people will solve those problems themselves and there's clearly a lot of people involved in the fringe a lot of people uh, mainly working for the, the venues in particular who I, th I think are, are, are possibly if the if the participants aren't making profits I think that the venue chains are, are pretty good at doing it what is the balance between paid employees and volunteers with those venue chains. I'm sorry there's, there's not a venue chain here and you're the closest to, to, to an expert in that area. What, what is the balance between paid employees and volunteers in there? I don't know the answer to that 
question. Um, but there are, but but in terms of, I guess, professional development as well. I mean, there's a great model here of people who are, you know, sort of not to mention a. Well, I'm going to mention a specific venue, but you know, Northern Stage, for example, who's who are a venue in Newcastle who have done a venue here for the last few years. They're in a new space this year. They've brought their entirely staffed with their volunteers. They bring them with them. It's a great way for them to learn how to build a theatre, for them to learn how to deal with a company, for them to learn how to uh, make work themselves. Um, I don't know what the balance is, but I know that there are different opportunities, and it's a great training ground for not just artists who are on stage, but for you know venue technicians, box office staff. It's you know lots of it's where lots of people start their career. Um, I to just throw a stat at you. Um, 77% of temporary staff, so that's the people who are passing through, felt that their employability had increased as a result of their work with festivals. That was exactly what <laughs> I, I was yeah. going to, to make, because there, when, I just want to make a more general um, umbrella statement. When we talk about economic impact, we have a, a model for measuring that, and you know it's, it's beds and it's spend and all the rest of it. But actually, there are a lot of elements of economic impact that we don't measure that are economic. And one of them is the, what happens to these volunteers, and particularly younger people, who then actually have enough courage sometimes, who maybe haven't been in work, have enough courage and have a story they can tell about themselves because they volunteered to go and get a job. That is an economic impact on a one-by-one -one basis. We don't measure that in a number, but we mustn't forget it. I guess I'm just asking out of an interest in Queen Bono, you know, who benefits and are, are these, these people who are making the fringe happen at, by staffing the box offices, manning the, the lighting stages, all of that, are they, are they benefiting as well? But there's just one, one last question. Uh, which occurred to me as as I sat down, and that is that I've been on the economy committee for two years now, and I don't think I've ever seen a panel come in front of us that's 80% women beforehand. Is that reflective of movers and shakers in Edinburgh festivals, and is that a good sign? Of course it's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say you'd never heard a panel be so articulate. <laughs> <laughs> that engaging, spirited, <laughs> convincing, persuasive. Yeah, mm. I mean so the cult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the, cu the cultural sector is uh, is driven by a lot of women, and strong, competent women. But also we're we have lots of gifted men as well, and we don't um, we don't have to think about it too much. We're you're, we're kind of consciously aware. It was actually interestingly, it was um, Gordon who pointed it out. Whereas I think we would feel that it was relatively normal for um, yeah, a panel of women to be speaking. We, we, there are occasional moments where we, we don't pay enough attention and, and something happens and you suddenly go, oh my goodness, there's a panel of men, but it's men on a, an event that we're organising, but it's, it's very rare. It has to be said, eight, uh, 10 out of 12 of our directors are men. So it's, uh, and, and, and if I could, sorry, I didn't catch your eye, <laughs> but um, the festival forum, so this um, umbrella body, is roughly half and half as I visually look around the table of men and women. Okay, thank you. Um, Alison Johnson. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I too, like Margaret, I'm sorry I couldn't join you last night, but I was taking part in a just festival event. <laughs> and, and then it dawned on me that I've also taken part previously in an international festival event where I joined the, the hordes of people running about Arthur's seat with torches on our heads. So I'll maybe discuss what my, my next venture, perhaps something in the fringe with, with or without Marco. <laughs> something to look forward to, or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember a few weeks back, I think I saw a, an article um, in one of our national newspapers. I think Jonathan Mills was suggesting that festivals needed more funding if they were going to maintain their prominent position you know, as, as a world leader. And I'd just like to understand a bit more about how much money uh, probably a question for Faith, how much money festivals Edinburgh do receive, you know, from, in total, from, from local and national government. What's the position at the moment? I don't have those... I'm very happy to, to get the festivals send individual details because we don't, we don't aggregate that, partly because it's for the individual festivals to n negotiate their, their terms with their, with their funders. Um, the, the challenges at the moment, obviously, are that... Um, and we, we, we completely understand that we're actually in a very, very privileged position with the city because we've had standstill funding when other budgets have, have actually been cut, and I just would li like to note that. And that 
also in very challenging economic circumstances, we've actually brought in more investment to our programmes. But the transformative effect of that investment, both in terms of the, the amazing projects that have taken place, the audiences and the profile um, is remarkable. And it's also remarkable that what those projects and that investment has allowed the festivals to do, because when they're invested in, they're innovative, is that almost all of them have extended their networks of contacts um, from the storytelling festival to the book festival with the, the alliance of book festivals around the world. They've used it not just to create programmes, but to create a wider, a wider network. We do have to look at this. It's part of the thundering. I don't want to preempt some of that work. It will definitely be part of the thundering hooves to analysis about what levels do those needs sit at. We did at the very beginning when Festivals Edinburgh was founded about what do we need to do to maintain. That's one thing, what we do already, which would you know, be a good thing. But actually what we should all be doing is investing in success. And at relatively modest levels, I think, can be transformation, transformational for a festival. The very first investment into the storytelling festival from Expo, I think, was something like £30,000. It was the foundation on which a massive network of storytelling festivals around the world was created and new opportunities were created for the artists involved in that festival. And Festivals Edinburgh, how big is your oh, team? Oh, we're, t we're, 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 uh, uh, we're almost all project funded. <coughs> so actually what we do is we, and we, we, just to explain, Festivals Edinburgh is the festivals. So the board of directors is the 12 festivals. They are my 12 bosses and my team works on their agenda. And we have a clear kind of business plan. We have collaborative projects that, that we agree to invest in around environment, innovation, programme, uh, development and uh, and marketing UK and international marketing but those projects are um, are a uh, you know they're 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 bound they're th they're in particular time scales they're only project fund funded so there's no there's a very small amount of core funding we're a very agile organisation um, we're not th we're not there to kind of serve uh, ourselves as, a, as an administration or an executive we are there to respond to the needs of the festivals and the possibilities of how partnership among ourselves and with our partners can enhance ourselves and how we work in the city and in Scotland as a whole. I'm sure it must be very challenging having 12 bosses. <laughs> oh, no, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the texture the is, yeah, that's, that's what it's all on about. the record. Um, I've, I know previously Edinburgh has discussed, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how far the discussion has gone, and I've no doubt it will come back, about, you know, the idea of a bed tax rather than a bedroom tax. Um, you know, so the, a, a tourist tax... And I'm just wondering if any of your organisations have been involved in that discussion, because perhaps some of that could be ring-fenced to reinvest in the festival if it is providing so many economic, social and cultural benefits. Gordon may want to say a little bit about this as well, but actually he and I have worked very closely on, and we, you know, I think it was called a visitor levy, which sounds slightly less controversial. There's been lots of work and examination of that, but actually we're not set on that. What we're trying to do and um, a want to be able to do, Gordon brought it up earlier on, is look at an alternative funding model. And it's not just about investing into our programmes, it's also about looking at the, 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 um, the marketing of the city as a whole and also the kind of public realm, if appropriate, as well. So all, all of those things are, are, have been identified as needs. Um, what we need to look at is the method of doing that, and we have to do that collaboratively. <coughs> I think I said at the outset, I think the things that are important to try and get this off the ground with a, with a degree of enthusiasm and commitment is, um, you know, the equal, equality of it. So if people feel as though they're paying a reasonable sum and they can see what they're getting back for it, a very efficient way of collecting whatever that sum is. And probably most importantly of the three is about the understanding of what that money is going to be spent on. I think the debate in the past about the visitor levy answered none of these and certainly didn't answer the uh, equality element where it was really going to hit the, um, the hoteliers um, far, far harder. And I think they had a perfectly legitimate case that said that was a, an unfair focus compared with who gets all the wider economic benefits in the city. So I don't want to predicate what might work. There are a number of models out there, particularly the sort of bid type schemes, um, which, which seem quite efficient and you can kind of cast the net uh, fairly flexibly. But I think if until we've written down what this amount of money will be spent on and the therefore predict the benefits and who gets these benefits, it'll be very hard to get any business to sign up to it. So I think you know the real push working with Marketing Edinburgh, working with the festivals, working with the city, and indeed working with hopefully some sort of leading thinkers in the private sector, is if we can achieve the third one first and then work out how the other two can support that, then I, I think we are talking to um, 
a listening environment. Uh, obviously, until people see the scale of that and understand what that means for the business, you, you can't predict entirely who will be enthusiastic and who might be reluctant followers. Um, but I think there is a, a general understanding that the private sector has to step up to the uh, to the post here and find a way of getting around this. And certainly I don't get an awful lot of pushback when I'm having these private conversations with people. It is about answering equality, efficiency and understanding what return they can expect to get because we've all got boards to convince when we're making investment cases. Thank you. I'd like to ask another question, convener, on a slightly different topic. Um, I think someone mentioned earlier that the sort of 60% participation from people in Edinburgh and yeah, I, I, you know, I still have concerns myself about who it is we're attracting. You know, I walk down the Royal Mile every day and have done for years, and there's a certain feeling about that crowd. And obviously, there's some people who who don't feel the festival is for them yet. So, just like a bit more information on that, and also with regards to the timing. Now, this is obviously a massive issue, and we're trying to fit in with global holidays. And I know from next year, I'm quite pleased to see that the international festivals dates will will align with, with other activity because, you know, it all seemed to me that last week was, there's just a different feeling in the city next week. But our schools went back to school last week. You know, it's right in the middle of the three-week run. Now, I know that there's Imaginate and there's the Festival of Science and there's things going on across the calendar, but I just wondered if that's reviewed from time to time. Are we doing everything that we can to include as many people as possible? And it's a particular area of the work at the moment of, of work at the moment uh, because we had carried out our social impact study. We've got more data around that, um, including questions in the household survey, which have allowed us to analyse the the levels of attendance. So we know that it's over ninety in the centre of Edinburgh. It's down at thirty seven in some other in um, in the the kind of least attending area. Uh, again. I, we're, we're not smug about this. I think it's important to note that those are quite high attendance figures for any community in any city in the world. But the festivals themselves individually are running programmes that are actually not included in those key attendance figures. They're running many of them year round engagement programmes actually out in the communities um, themselves. Um, however, working with the city on a, a programme called Creative Lives, we're, we're starting to do serious in-depth mapping, not just of where things have hap are happening and what numbers, but what kinds of work is happening and needs to happen to be able to address uh, the needs of those communities. And it's, again, a key area of work we'll be looking at in Thundering Hooves too. Thank you. Um, just a couple of specific examples, and forgive the book festival reference again, I'm sorry about that, but um, some years ago we set up a schools program, so it's important to us um, to overlap with the start of school, and of course that date varies each summer, and some summers it's really very hard, um, but we um, sell uh, sort of tickets, if you will, through schools and provide buses, and teachers can bring classes into the book festival. We have special programs for them. We have a day that's just for them. Um, and this can reach quite widely, as widely as, as a school and a teacher uh, is interested. So that's a way to reach out, and it covers all different um, social social economic classes. Um, there are also specific uh, events. So again, we've done something with uh, kind of creating a story in a picture book uh, with school children and Craig Miller. So we will go within Edinburgh and go to some of those communities that wouldn't think of what of, uh, walking into some of the festivals and actually bring that out to them. So I think a lot of the festivals really focus in that kind of area. It's important. Not all festivals have to do all things in the same way and on the same scale. One of the, one of the benefits about working together is to understand the strengths in particular areas of particular festivals work. But what we do think about together is are we delivering to the community? And we're doing that more intensively than we ever have done before. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay. Um, John McAlpin. Thank you very much, convener, and um, good morning. Um, I wanted to actually further develop the points that my um, my colleague Alison had raised about tax. Um, we've been given some figures from uh, Spice, I believe, um, on economic impact, um, 261 million. I take it that's based on your, your own last economic impact assessment, is it? And uh, 5,242 full-time jobs in Edinburgh. Um, I take it that um, that 261 million will include tax revenue. Uh, no, it only includes two. That's a two, basically that is an analysis of our tourism um, visits from outside Edinburgh. So it's it's the the economic impact is based on tourism impacts. So right. Yeah. So in terms of say the amount 
of money raised through people VAT, for example, as people come into the city and stay, that, that would be in addition to that £261 million? Uh, What we analyse is the amount of spend on uh, shopping, transport, entertainment, food and drink and accommodation <coughs> by people coming into the city from outside um, <coughs> Edinburgh. Right. Yeah. So it would include VAT then? Yeah. It must include yeah. VAT then. And similarly with the jobs, that would include income tax and national insurance that was generated? Well, we count that as... We just count the number of of employees, of full-time equivalents. Yeah. Right. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a financial sum, it's a, um, it's a right, numerical okay. sum. Yeah. But, the, but, but those jobs obviously are yeah, yeah. generating tax and, and yeah, national yeah, insurance yeah. and things like that as well. Um, and your main funders are City of Edinburgh Council and the Scottish Government, well, your main it, public funders? This is the thing. We're 12 festivals. And to give you uh -huh. an example of the variations in models, we have a, we have a, a festival that is funded 50%, 25-25, between the City of Edinburgh Council and the... Um, and uh, through, Creative, through Creative Scotland, uh, so through the National Agency. Expo is an additional amount of money to invest into programmes. So it's a programme innovation and development fund for Scottish artists and then we would have a festival like the book festival where 80% of their income is self-generated so the, the the models vary to such an ex extraordinary degree it would be hard to pin it absolutely. down absolutely I totally understand a very sophisticated yeah. operation but in terms of your main public funds funders are the city of Edinburgh council and the Scottish if you look government. at scale yeah yeah uh, through creative Scotland sorry yeah but, yeah which is ultimately the Scottish government money now the, the tax revenue the tax generated you were talking about looking at other ways other ways to raise mm. additional taxes mm. from the private sector and uh, because of the what you've described uh, very eloquently as the squeeze on uh, public sector funding but of course you already raise a lot of tax through the festivals don't you but that doesn't go back to your main funders a uh, no. No. <laughs> Do you think it would it would make a difference if it did? So that so that you're talking about the, the tax that his, you generate. Yeah, yeah. They, they, your main public funders give mm. you grants, mm. um, but the the tax that you generate doesn't go back to your main public funders. Mm. It goes back to the UK government. Yeah. Well, that would be. A, I mean, again, that would be an issue for you to address, not us. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 I can understand you may not want to be drawn on these yeah. issues. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think it's an important yeah, point no. to make. You know that uh, you are living in very constrained times, and for example, the Scottish mm. government's infrastructure budget has been cut by twenty six percent, and uh, you are presumably generating a lot of the tax that could be reinvested in infrastructure to benefit the festival. And I think there's complication, complications. It has to be said around the tax base in the city as well, because of the services, including our own, that are then being provided for a wider catch significantly <laughs> global but you know in Scotland wider catchment area and we know there's challenges around that as well. Sure and for Mr Dewar in particular I know that you've talked in the past about air passenger duty um, and does that have an effect in the context of the Edinburgh Festival? Um, I think it does I mean the, the analysis we've done on air, air passenger duty is that the current levels that, um, that apply here probably realise uh, 2 million missing passengers that would otherwise be flying in and out of Scotland. Now, a proportion of that, I believe, would obviously be uh, associated with the festivals and other tourism, other business, other um, leisure trips for Scots outbound as well. So I, I haven't got the breakdown of what the, the proportion of that would be. But 2 million passengers uh, missing from the Scottish economy is a pretty serious gap that we could otherwise have had economic value from. So, yeah, it's pretty significant. Apply to the festival as well, because Amy talked earlier about the difficulties for long haul flights of bringing people and how expensive it was, I take it you would be able to bring more people if it was more economically viable? Yeah, we believe so in the sense that the, the real impact is on the airlines when they're looking at where to start, where to invest next mm -hmm. and APD in the UK is more than double the next most expensive and in fact most of our direct competition has got no air, air passenger duty at all so Ireland doesn't uh, France doesn't, Holland doesn't, Spain doesn't and so on. So when we're talking to an EasyJet or Ryanair and they're looking at where do they put the next aircraft, we start a minimum of £14 per passenger behind our, our opposition in Europe uh, and given that my charge 
charges for the use of the airport, never mind the tax associated with it, is less than that, then that's quite a big gap to try and bridge. Uh, and Edinburgh has to trade very well on its wider value, where um, people know that it's a, a place where you can make a route very successful. Um, it's an interesting statistic, actually, that Edinburgh, although it's less than half the size in passenger numbers of Manchester Airport, we have more international <coughs> arrivals than Manchester Airport. Uh, and I think, you know, you look at things at like the festival as being a, a really strong explanatory factor behind that. Um, and, you know, it just feeds that largest of Scottish industries, which is tourism. Thank you very much. And just one last question, a completely different topic, uh, convener. Um, just a, a personal interest. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, the uh, creative industries and we're going to be looking at the film industry in future. I'm uh, co-chair of the cross-party group on culture and we're going to be looking at some of the challenges of the film industry. I know that there was a lot of talk around the, the moving of the time of the film festival and now that that's been in place for a few years, I just wondered whether you, you thought that that move of the film festival to June was the right thing to do or whether it should be um, at the same time as the international festival as it used to the be? The film festival feel very strongly that it was the right decision. Um, obviously, any festival needs to carry on asking big questions um, where, where issues are, are raised around it, but um, at the moment it feels like it was absolutely the, the right decision. Uh, but you need to talk to them directly to okay. get some more detail on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, just before I, I, I bring in Jenny Mara, just to go back to this APD point, um, I mean, I listened to what you had to say, Gordon, but there's not much evidence that Edinburgh Airport's expansion is being held back by APD, is there? It's, every time I <coughs> go to the airport, I fall over workmen building your latest new extension. And, and wouldn't it be better if we were doing it twice as fast? So uh, I, I think that it, the evidence is very strong. There are two million passengers missing from Scotland. I reckon the Edinburgh share of that would be at least a million. Um, and, that's, and it's all about connectivity. It's all about the pace we can get the, the airlines to invest in Scotland and give us bigger. Because we know that wherever we get it easier and cheaper to come to Scotland, people will come in huge numbers. I think you know, it's just really evident in um, just walking around the streets of Edinburgh this year just how many more long-haul passengers there are, Chinese and particular, India in particular, Middle Eastern. I'm saying um, salam alaikum as often as I'm saying good morning in the airport at the moment because we've got these new routes. Where we make it possible, people come. If you talk to uh, Nick Finnegan at the castle, he can plot his visitor numbers directly against the routes that start at Edinburgh Airport. If we make it easy, they will come. It's as simple as that. And at the moment, it's hard for me to attract as many as we could do simply because we start a minimum of 14 and on occasion as much as £140 per passenger behind my competitors in Europe. Okay, Alison Johnson's about to explode, but, well, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, convener. You will let this pass. I'll, for I'll, now. I'll let it pass for now. Okay, okay, uh, Jenny Mara. Thank you, convener. Um, I just want to start by um, maybe putting on record, if the convener will let me, my party's thanks to, for the work you do because the festivals are such an important um, and successful thing for Scotland, and I think we all really, really appreciate the the, um, the hard work that goes on. I wanted to start, uh, I've got a couple of questions. I wanted to start with Kath, if that's okay, with a question about the fringe. And it's to go back to the issue of participation. I was interested to, um, to ask you, Kath, um, I'm always conscious that you said it was a very expensive undertaking um, to put on a production at the Fringe. I know there are a variety of different organisations that put on productions at the Fringe, but I'm, I'm always conscious when I'm going through the Fringe programme that a lot of schools um, put on productions at, at the Fringe, and that's very, um, a very exciting and confidence-building and life-affirming experience for those pupils involved. Can you tell me um, maybe a bit about the balance of um, schools, um, maybe from more deprived communities, in Scotland that maybe undertake to do that because of the expense and if the Fringe actually provides any support um, both in terms of supporting a production um, to come to the Fringe and maybe financial as well. So we don't, we're an open access festival so we're not directly supporting financially any of the companies that are coming and I, and I, think, it, I think it can be expensive for companies to come. There are other models where it's not so quite often when school groups, are, school groups are producing or student groups are producing on the fringe they're not in your I guess the kind of traditional venue model that Marco was describing before uh, and I think it is a, it's an incredibly important part of a, of a young person's development we know from the impact study as well that taking part and even just seeing the festivals is a, is a great part of sparking imagination and well-being and, and so on but we it's it's our it's not just schools in Scotland too there's an, an amazing um literally thousands of American high school children who come each year to take part in the festival they do it um they fundraise themselves at home to come and it's a it's the first step for them 
quite often being outside the, the states, let alone uh, performing elsewhere. And 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 I think it's a, it's a really important. I think your point is good. It's it's important that we continue to make sure that there are other models and other venues and other ways for for companies who are here for different reasons. As Amy said, one of the things we're talking to with companies all the time when we're talking to them about why about coming to the fringe is why they're coming. So for a for a vast number of the professional companies taking part, it's because of the media exposure and the industry exposure and that international links that will lead to onward touring. But for other, you're absolutely right. For other companies and artists, it's not that at all. It's something very different. So it's our job to support all of that. I mean, I understand that you're the host and don't necessarily have funding streams for that kind of thing. But do you think there are opportunities for that for other organisations? My perception is, and this may be wrong, that it is more um, affluent children and communities that that get that ex the chance to put on the production at the fringe. Do you think there is an opportunity maybe for for some funding, either city council or government, to to support that from around our country? Our opportunities, and actually, it's interesting your point, Alison, about the about the dates, because we we talk a lot about the dates. Um, we're we 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 are still tied to a bank holiday at the end of August term. Dates peregrinate around the the calendar too, and so I think as we make the, the leap next year, as we always do, uh, every seven years, and, and therefore we'll coincide more with school term dates, I think there's, there are greater opportunities. And yes, absolutely, it's one thing that we want to be working on. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think probably Faith would be surprised as former director of DCA if I didn't ask a question that was slightly Dundee related. But you talked, Faith, a little bit about um, the seminars you do, I think, for other other parts of the world as well. And I'm just conscious that my home city put in um, its bid to become the UK uh, city of culture uh, last year. Unfortunately, we were um, we were pipped to the post on that. But these kind of um, seminars that that you're putting on, given the experience, are, are these available in Scotland as well to, to cities like Dundee and, and other communities to, yeah. to build up their own e e festivals? Yeah. Again, um, I would say Dundee's doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> but the example I gave earlier on, so I was up in Aberdeen, we were basically running a version of one of our seminars around collaboration, how we work collaboratively with the festival, uh, with, I think... There's like 13 maybe festivals there. So that's it. we do exactly that. And we do sometimes we do a standard seminar, but a lot of the time, so for example, the venue network that's been set up in Edinburgh, we did initial <laughs> sessions with them to get them up and running. Um, and yeah, that, that, that information and that sharing is available, not just in, um, in how we collaborate, but on areas like cultural tourism, uh, our innovation program um, we not only have we talked about it and presented about it around Scotland but the models that we created we had a thing called a geek in residence program so you often talk about artists in residence we had geeks in residence in our uh, in our festivals uh, and Culture Hack Scotland which was a kind of bringing together of the festivals and their challenges and the developer sector to create new approaches to solving the big issues that we have creating new apps and tools both those programs have rolled out as national programs and similarly um, on our environmental work we have um, uh, again, we learned a lot. We evolved our practice. We learned how to work with venues, artists, but realised that we we couldn't do what we needed to do, and we Scotland couldn't do in the cultural sector what it needed to do without that becoming a national programme. So actually, Festivals Edinburgh created its first spin-off company, which is called Creative Carbon Scotland, which is now uh, joined with the Federation of Scottish Theatre and and Scan, and and created a new body that's now leading on behavioural change in environmental uh, behaviour environmental behaviour change in Scotland. So we're very proud of that slightly. We've learned how to do a peculiar business model that we've created where we test things out, we share them, <laughs> the pain and the process, uh, so other people realise these things don't happen readily in a collaborative environment. But when we get there, we get there very thoroughly, and when we get there, we share. Thank you very much. Can I ask one final question, Convener? It's, um, it's on thundering hooves on, on the review because I see this as a very strategic and important piece of work because the last one in 2006 was, it was, was so and was very successful. I was lucky enough to get one of the last tickets to see James I at this festival and enjoyed it immensely. And then also was lucky enough to speak to some of the cast afterwards who were, um, who were talking about the importance of the festivals and what they thought as um, aspiring, you know, as, as they were going through, through their careers and the importance of audiences and the audiences taking the festivals seriously and the critical mass of critics that come to the city. So I'm kind of, I know we've talked around this a bit this morning, I'm kind of interested as you approach Thundering Hooves 2, 
are you, I think as you go into any review, you're probably aware of the main threats, uh, maybe from other parts of the world to that. Can you describe kind of the main things or what the, the main thing that Scotland and Edinburgh has to do to remain the premier international arts festival? Best in our programmes. I mean, that, that is a classic example, that, you know, the triumph of that trilogy at the, at the International Festival, the collaboration that was created, that could not have happened without the Expo Fund investment. It simply couldn't. It would have been unimaginable for all the parties involved, and yet it's a, it's, you know, it's a wonderful production. So the, that's the biggest sing- that is the biggest single thing. The other things are around trends that we need to respond to, I think. And uh, a kind of increasing understanding, not just, you know, in cultural cities and festival cities about the possibilities that investment in these areas can bring in terms of tourism, in terms of all the things we're talking about, all the things that we achieve. So we're still looking at our competitive environment in terms of other cities. But as important are are just a very core threat, which is how do we preserve what we do, the heart of what we do, which then leads to every other impact and particularly to the economic impact. And that is the diverse, quality, international nature of our programmes. And that, that takes investment. That's our content. Thank you. OK, we've got time for just one final question from Dennis Roberts. Uh, and thank you, Convener. I'd, um, again, it's about opportunities and challenges. I'm just wondering in terms of um, uh, people with disabilities, in terms of performers uh, uh, within the festivals, you know, what the opportunities are for people um, with disabilities uh, uh, to be the performers. Uh, and again, accessibility to all the festival venues, etc. And, you know, Susan, you mentioned the book festival quite often. How accessible is that to people, say, with sensory impairment, you know, whether it be uh, loss of vision or, say, who are deaf or hard of hearing? And I'm just interested, you know, how do we accommodate people with... Cause disability, again, is, is far-reaching and very, very diverse as well. Uh, do we do enough, and are we um, managing that? Um, Susan, maybe first. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are constant challenges, um, and... Uh, the festivals think about these things because they're talking about their audience, they're talking about their performers. So um, Saturday night at the book festival, Frank Gardner, the uh, BBC journalist who was almost killed some time ago in Syria, uh, wheeled himself up on a stage at the book festival and uh, and gave an absolutely superb uh, event and conversation. Um, I've been to dance programs where some of the dancers in a dance troupe have been uh, have had uh, sort of mental deficiencies and have had other difficulties and others have been um, fully enabled. Um, So a lot of the performances can um, accommodate uh, disabilities of various sorts. The sites are all challenges in various ways and they all bring bring different kinds of of challenges. Uh, So theatres are better able to provide uh, possibly um, you know, words for those who can't hear, and, and it, it just, they all vary, but we work on this all the time. It's just, they're very specific and unique challenges often for the audiences. Um, I think the performers uh, were better able somehow to to handle some of their particular challenges. Faith, you'll have, have more yeah, information. We have a cross-festival dis- um, accessibility guide, which is which has been evolved over the last few years, and app, and um, all the individual festivals, you know, work in their own ways across this area. But we've aggregated all of that information, so in a way that we ha- we haven't done before. I think, and from a performer perspective, I think one of the most wonderful things about how uh, about the Made in Scotland program and about how um, the Expo Fund investment is the support that's been given and the, the successes that have come from um, some of the most amazing performers, uh, disabled performers. It's actually seen. As a major strength in, in the work in Scotland and what we've been able to do um, across our festivals is, is, is promote that work and, and present it to the wider world. Scotland companies, which have been very successful here, not just here, actually have toured some of the some of the uh, most touring uh, work that's come out of Made in Scotland. We, as Faith says, we work a lot about on access issues with venues, of course, um, not just fringe venues. You know, old venues and, and particularly temporarily fringe venues are not necessarily instantly accessible. But we've done a lot of work across festival to try and at least gather that information, see where there are things that we can do to help. And, and the other thing that we've been doing is, uh, over the last few weeks of this festival is take um, advantage of the combination of artists and practitioners from elsewhere in the city to talk to them about what's happening elsewhere and if there are programmes, and, and uh, particularly on deaf access, actually, to, to, that we can roll out and there are things that we can do quite perhaps more easily that will, that will help build that audience. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I think that brings us to the end of our, our time. Um, on behalf of the committee, can I thank you all very much for, for coming along for what was a very uh, interesting and engaging session, and you've given us a lot to think about. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's been very good to meet you all. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, then do please get in touch with us directly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, at this point, we'll have a short suspension and go into private session. Thank you.